So when we got the hydro up and running in the first, first um, three videos, it's over, over there on the other side of the river, uh, we were running off a temporary battery bank and now we've got proper batteries, proper inverter and it's putting out reliable power, which is really good. Um, there's one caveat that I'll go over later on, but because we've got past the teething problems and we've now got a stable system, I think we'll go over what we've got, um, how it's working. There's quite a few things people have pointed out to me that I've done that weren't ideal We'll go over what those are um, and why they're not ideal. And I'll also go over what our next version is going to be. So I think we'll go up to the top of the hill, start with the intake, and then we'll work our way back down. And then um, at the end, I think we'll go over the inverter and I'll show you what power it's actually putting out. Just quickly for those who have clicked on this, perhaps as the, oh, there's a heron. See him there? I think I disturbed him it's after the frogs. So for those of you who, I'm sure most of you do, because if you clicked on this, you probably know what microhydro is, but what you do is you take, um, you need difference in height. So you collect water at a height, you send it down some pipes, and because of the effect of gravity, it arrives at the bottom at a higher pressure than it was at the top, and you use that high pressure water to spray a jet against a wheel with some fins on it, and then that spins, which spins a motor or a generator on top of it, which generates your electricity. So it's very simple in principle, but getting it to work and getting decent power is probably where it's a bit complicated, oh, as well as trying to make it affordable, you know. Chuck enough money at this, you can make it easy. You want to do it cost effectively, not waste your money on expensive pipe that you don't have to if you can find it cheaper that kind of stuff, that's where the challenge lies. But we'll go and have a look at these intakes and we'll start there. We had our second child born there two days ago. And I say the lack of sleep, handling with it, handling it fine, but you're not climbing a hill. But when you come out and do this, certainly highlights you've not had, not had as much. Okay, so we have, we're near the intake. We have 75 meters of head, 250 meters of pipe length. Okay, so those are our specs. I don't know the flow rate, available flow rate. Okay, let's just go over the intakes. I'll tell you about the flow rate in a second because we have two intakes. We have one here and there's one over there you can't see from here. The reason I've done that is because I don't want to drain one of the streams. I want to take some water from one, some water from the other, and therefore divide the power between them so that each stream seems to have some of its original flow. You know, I'm just not drain, draining it. This is a decision I've made that seems to be, a lot of people are commenting and saying, two runs is a bad idea. Um, it's working for us though, but I understand why one, one run is better. I just, I'm valuing our environmental impact above our power consumption or power generation. So that's why I've done two. It has made it more difficult. It has made it more expensive, um, but that's why I've done it. Okay, so the flow rate. We have five liters per second per intake. So when I'm talking about these multiple intakes, this is why our system's a little bit more complex as far as the specs, because it's 250 meter pipe run, 75 meter head per intake. So we've got two intakes and each intake has an available flow of around five liters per second. But that seems to be somewhere near the maximum, the maximum of each little stream. So it's not, I was never going to use five liters a second because that would dry it, you know, drain it. So there's no water flowing down. And this flows all the way down. You see how big these trees are. Lots of them all the way down. So I really don't want to take very much of this water. So we have that per intake. These are the intakes. They're just 110 mil drainage pipe with uh, holes drilled in it. That goes down, pipe there, stop cock. And then that's my vent tube just to let any air out. I've had a bit of trouble with the weight of the pipe, with the water in it, kind of pulls the pipe down and then pops this off the end. 
so that, that can be a bit of a problem. Um, we'll start, I think, with the intakes as far as what, to, what have I done that's not, you're not supposed to do, and quite a few people have told me this. Um, so what you're supposed to do, if you want the best money no option, get a Coanda screen. People have said about 3D printing them, but uh, the thing with a Coanda screen is it filters it, it's stainless steel or some kind of shiny metal, I think it's stainless, which means that the water flowing over it moves very smoothly. People have mentioned 3D printing a Coanda screen. So why, what, okay, so Coanda screens are expensive. I've had a look at getting them and A, they're very difficult to get hold of in the UK. I haven't found a single person that sells them. I've found some custom manufactured ones, but as soon as you put custom in front of it, you're expected to pay an enormous amount of money. The other place I've found is Power Spout, which is in New Zealand. And there are a thousand New Zealand units of currency. I don't know what they actually um, use over there. But by the time it gets here, they're about a grand each, taxes and shipping and everything. So they're really, really expensive for a commander screen. And when people mention 3D printing, if it's steel, stainless, it's smooth. So when the water goes over it, you've got this nice smooth um, filter. Like, so what it is, is it's lots of grills layered on top of each other. The water flows over, water will go in and it kind of, because it's flowing down, it's like a ramp like this. I'll try and put a picture of one on, on the screen. The water, the stream flows over it. Water goes into a collection chamber at the bottom. Um, and because the flow is flowing over the surface of the filter, it washes away any debris. So leaves and stuff don't clog, clog the intakes. Now, if it's 3D printed, I know a little bit about 3D printing, um, but if you're using a traditional 3D printer, it's got layer lines in it, which makes it really uh, rough. So I can imagine that getting stuff stuck on it because it's not smooth. And if you use the other type of printing, which is the laser printing, a, the printers are far more expensive. B, they don't print as large. So I just find that that solution, when I have enough money to buy it, yeah, great. But now it's just too much money. Also, the problem that we have with the intakes, the intakes work brilliantly, apart from one thing. And that thing I don't think would be solved by a Coanda screen. So you can see here, This is my sort of dam that I created just with rocks. They're not cemented in or anything. A lot of the water's leaking out the bottom, but this is on right now. And you can see I'm not using barely any of the water. It's keeping up nicely. Um, you see how clear the water is. So I really don't have a problem with clogging. It's just not an issue for me. What I do have a problem is very fine silt. So I'll show you a um, clip of the bottom of our water tank where we collect our water. And that has a very, very fine silt. It's, it's sort of like a soil. It's not sand, it's not heavy. Um, and if you move around in the water, put your hand around, it kind of sw uh, swells around. It's, it's very fine silt. So it does get um, sucked through here, but I put meshes on in one of my first versions and the mesh just clogged with the silt. Look, it's so fine, it sticks, sticks to it. Um, so I've taken the meshes off because it would just clog the, the, hole, the you know, tiny holes. I used mosquito net to start with. Then I used, you know, ladies or girls, ballerina tutu mesh because it was a bit coarser. But it just, um, the silt was too fine. So if we had coanda screens, I'm fairly sure that the silt would still get through the coanda screen. Um, so version two, um, I'll go through the rest, of the rest of the system and then we'll go through what we're actually going to do to resolve these problems because I have an idea or several ideas, um, but I'm really pleased with the system right now. I have to say, I am gonna do a version two because I feel like I'd like to refine it and I'd like to try and get as much out of this as we can. However, I've got so much power now that we're considering getting an electric car to put the power somewhere because I don't know what to do with it. I'm, I'm, I've just got too much. We're, not, we're being very efficient with what we're using, but we, I, I'm having to switch heaters on most of the night and day, even though we don't need it, just because we've got too much power coming in. So I don't have the problem right now of we need more power. It's just, I suppose, from an exercise, I'd like to get the most out of the system if I'm going to make one, you know, from a sort of creative standpoint or an invention standpoint, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to do as good a job as we can. So 
We'll go over the pipe diameter next. That's a big thing people have mentioned. So the pipe diameter that I've used is 40 millimeter and it's 40 millimeter six bar, which is just on the limit. We are getting about 80 PSI, which I think uh, is also six bar right at the turbine. So the pipe set its limit at the bottom, but the, the pressure increases as you go downhill. So 95% of the pipe is within its pressure um, limits. And the last bit is on its pressure limit. So I'd say we're fine with that, but the price difference was astronomical. 550 meters of this pipe cost me 600 quid. Whereas I had um, prices four or five times that if you go up to a higher bar um, pipe. This is an irrigation pipe from a farm supplies place. I'll put the link in the description because this was the cheapest I could find. And the pipe is really the, the most expensive element of this, um, especially if you're running long lengths like we are. But what people have said is that the friction loss. So what, when you go down diameters, that's, this is a smaller diameter pipe than um, is ideal. I chose it because it is actually fine for our flow requirements at the minute. But if you get a bigger pipe, what happens is you've got a diameter of a pipe, it's a circle, and it's the outer section where the water contacts that creates friction. The center core, if you like, is water rubbing against water so it flows much faster. The outside of the inside, does that make sense? Is rubbing against the edge of the pipe, which means that there's friction and therefore it slows the water down. So if you have a smaller diameter pipe, if you imagine the bit of water in the middle that isn't rubbing against the sides is smaller than if you had a really big pipe and you've got a large chamber of water in the middle that has, you know, can flow through much faster. So with hydro, you really want as big a diameter as you can afford because the water's not impeded by the friction on the side. So I've gone right on the limit of the pipe here we're getting good power, so I'm not, I'm not complaining about my system. Um, but one of the things that if you did this, and I would recommend this to other people too, get as big a pipe as you can afford. However, we didn't know whether this was going to work at all. I was a bit skeptical. You know, you see things on the internet, you're like, are they just lying about their figures? Is this, um, can it really be done? Is my plot suitable? All that kind of stuff. I didn't want to go chucking 10 grand at this system and then suddenly realizing it's a farce. It doesn't work. The generator's rubbish. Like, I wanted to get version one done and for 600 quid for the pipe it's much better than throwing thousands and thousands and then discovering you've made a mistake somewhere else so the pipe um if you were doing this on the cheap smaller pipe okay fine if you really don't have the available cash and we didn't at the time still don't that's why it's still this size pipe um but you know don't go any smaller than 40 and we have a very long head a uh, very high head very long so you know, we've got other things working for us. If you're trying to do a mini system, much more than ours, um, just get as big a pipe as you can afford. Okay, so version, version two. I don't know if this would be a final version. My plan, okay. So we've gone over the intakes, we've gone over the problems with them. We've gone over the pipe, we've gone over the limitations with that. Um, the turbine is fine and I can upgrade that later if we have to. I have heard that Pelton wheels are supposed to be more efficient at high head, low flow systems. So very, very tall water, high pressure, but not a lot of water seems to be Pelton wheels are better. They're more expensive, the system is more expensive. Um, so I've just gone with this, which is a Turgo wheel. Um, so we're gonna continue using that, but the problems that we're gonna try and fix are the, um, the filter, or the, the inlets, and the diameter of pipe, because we've hit our ceiling on the power right now. How are we gonna solve that? I still wanna take two, in, two inlets, because I don't wanna start, you know, you might say, just, just get one commander screen and then it's half the price, but I just really don't wanna drink. I don't wanna affect this, um, it's such a beautiful plot, and I don't wanna be this human that just turns up and just ruins everything, because he's, you know, big headed and reckons he can just use all the water for his own power consumption. So I'm trying to be as sensitive as I possibly can with this. So we're keeping the two inlets. I also want to be as financially, savvy as I can with this because I don't want to just lob money at it so we're going to keep the intakes to get rid of that silt um, what I'm going to do is get a collection um, chamber there's a word for this that I've forgotten it's, um, I don't know I'll put it on the screen but what I'm going to do is take a source from there 
the source from there where they are. I'm going to continue using the same diameter of pipe and I'm going to send them down to a large vat, huge plastic uh, container, fill that up so that the silt settles at the bottom. Um, and because there's not very really much of it, I'm just trying to keep it out the lines. From there, I'm going to take a 90 millimeter pipe, a single 90 millimeter pipe, and I'm going to run it all the way down to the turbine location. So we're taking the water from two, but I only have one run of much larger pipe. Um, and then I've got a collection vessel, which means that the silt should settle at the bottom. I shouldn't have to go down the route of very expensive coanda screens. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of do the upgrades a stage at a time, because if we've got the pipe working, we've got the collection chamber and it's still not working, uh, at least I've done that infrastructure. And then we can add coanda screens at a later time. So that's our plan with version two, version two. Uh, with a single pipe, I'm going to have to make a manifold. And I'm a little confused as to the, the science as to why two inlet pipes. People have said two is bad because what you're doing is, I, I don't understand this, okay? So perhaps if you, if you know the scientific reason, it'd be great if you could let me know. And one thing, good thing about YouTube, I wish you could do a project first, put it on YouTube, and then somehow travel back in time to redo it because so many people let me know so many useful things in the comments that I wish I'd done it in the first place, but you don't know that till you put it out and then everybody lets you know afterwards, which is good for version two, but you know, I've already done it. So if you do know the science behind this, it'd be great to know, but two, in, two pipes, what I've got is I've got two pipes and they come down into separate nozzles. So they come in at either side, they're completely separate runs. My justification for that in my head was that I want the water to be as fast as possible, coming down each run. I know speed isn't necessarily what you're aiming for here, it's pressure. But then I thought if you've separated them completely and they both come in from separate sides, what you're not doing is slamming the water into a manifold, which takes it to a full stop. You've got this very abrupt angle change and then you're taking the pressure off this box. And it, it just, in my mind, felt like that was not what you're trying to achieve. I felt like you wanted a nice smooth run. It just comes straight down the hill, nice smooth curve, and just goes straight into the turbine via a nozzle. That was my justification. I've had a couple of people mention that the, uh, like, does the water slow down? You know, if you've got one jet coming in one side, one jet coming in the other side, does the other one slow the spin down? And my thought was if you've got two people on the side of merry-go-rounds and one's pushing and he's stronger, the other one on the other side is pushing but he's not as strong, it doesn't slow the merry-go-round. It still speeds it up, doesn't it? It's just not speeding up at the same rate each side. So I know that the manifold is the correct way to go. I just don't know the science as to why sending two pipes into a manifold and then splitting them back off you do something similar with cars, don't you? You put a pipe between two exhaust runs to balance the pressure between them, but I don't, I don't understand why this is the right thing to do. So I think we are gonna do the one pipe, 90 millimeters down to a manifold, and then take two, two outlets off that onto each side of the turbine. But I'm doing it because people say it. I just don't know. I don't know this kind of science as to why. Sorry, there's so much talking in this one and not very much doing. It's, you know, everything's done really. I'm just showing what's, what's going on. So here's the turbine. There's one run coming in. There's the other run coming in. See here, there's the stream as it arrives. There's the river. Here it is running. Now, it's running well at the moment, but let me just turn it off, or rather turn it down. Okay, so as you can see, we've got two pipes. They're coming from there, going into one nozzle. The other one comes from here, goes into the other nozzle starting to rain, lovely. The, um, the reason I've just opened those instead of closing them to turn it off, this is the caveat with our system. It puts out 750 watts continuously, nice and stable, barely fluctuates. But that silt, what happens is these nozzles have a metal cone on the inside, and when you've unscrewed it to the correct pressure, 
I think what's happening is the silt over a couple of days collects around that hole and slowly reduces the diameter of the jet that you're getting. So over a day, or uh, it's probably, I come out every day to reset it, but over a couple of days, the power just drops off a bit. So th this is why our, our cap, you know, the caveat is that the power is 750 stable, but I have to come out and open it. So that's why I open the valves instead of closing it to turn it off, because it just lets any of the silk come flying out. Um, but because it's not sandy, I'm not concerned about any damage. It just sort of builds up around the, uh, the sort of the rim of the nozzle. So let's power it back up again. Can you hear the speed? <coughs> Can you hear the speed increase as I open the second nozzle? So I can't actually see the power that it's putting out because it's all the way over in the barn, and I don't have a smartphone, so I can't check on my phone, see what it's doing. But through trial and error, I've discovered that 50 psi on both sides seems to be the high. I, I haven't completely checked every psi because it's a five-minute trip to go and check, but um, I'm finding that that gives us 750 watts. Um, so. I just have to come down and just open it every other day just to make sure it stays. And you kind of watch, if the, the watts start dropping off by 20 or 30, you know that it's starting to get clogged. Okay, so when we've come down here, you can hear all the air working its way out the system. I've just cleaned the, um, cleared the nozzles out, so I'm just waiting for all that to build back up again. So we'll come down with the single larger pipe. There we go, 90 millimeter. We'll come down to um, a manifold and then we'll take two, two pipes off it and try and use the same sort of direction. So we've got nice, nice even flow from the manifold. And for now, I'm going to keep this turbine. However, the power spout turbines are, they're the Pelton wheels. They might be better for our situation. But I'm going to do the pipe infrastructure first. And then I feel like upgrading the uh, turbine at the end is less work than trying to unravel large lengths of pipe all the way up the hill. So we'll do it stages at a time. Um, I may even end up making my own because quite a lot of people complain about the standard, the standard ones because they're not tailored to their own needs. So we might do that. It's not that complicated to make one. Um, so I'm going to go into the inverter room now, or I use this room, which I'll show you the actual power output. Um, and yeah, really, really impressed with what we're putting out at the minute. We have plans for other, other water generation projects here as well. To get this first one up and running, so we've got our base power, and then we can start exploring more exciting ideas, such as these nanobots that I'm... They're not bots, you know, they're, but they're nano turbines, Like a mesh network of nano turbines. That'll be fun. So we'll go over the cable whilst we're working our way up here. We've got, I think it's 125 meters, uh, six millimeter, three core. Um, I think it's six millimeter. It was rated up to 55 or 60 amps because if the turbine's putting out two kilowatts like it's capable of, that's 50 amps because I got 48 volt version of the turbine. That's important because if you get the lower volt version, you get higher amps. Um, so, the cable runs all the way up to the utility room. We've got a three phase to two phase bridge rectifier. So it turns the AC current to DC current so that it can charge, well, so, you know, so it goes into the inverter with the correct, um, is it called polarity, AC versus AC, DC? Um, so that's the cable, very simple really, as far as it's, um, you know, makeup. It's not, com not complex at all, it's just, Getting it working can be a bit fiddly, especially if you've got to walk away up the hill every time something goes wrong. 
I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a whole video. I'm gonna do a whole video on this inverter because it's so good. It's so good. This is the power. There, 748 watts, 97 volts, 7.7 .7 amps. As you can see, it's just sitting really nicely. And that, that's, the, that's the case all day until you start to see it drop off. Um, but it'll drop off for over a day. It might go from 750 to 650. So it doesn't drop off sharply. It just slowly does it. And you get the sense that perhaps it's starting to clog. But it's not that far to go. At least I don't have to go all the way up to the intake. Um, that would be frustrating if I had to go. Well, a bit of exercise. It's not all that bad, is it? Um, so, like I said, I'm going to do a whole video on this inverter because it's amazing. Um, the So the power from the turbine. I'm only going over this really in case you haven't seen our other videos. Um, but the power, really dark here. Can you see? Just. That's the rectifier in there. Power comes through here, up this, goes into solar connectors here. And this guy has uh, two inputs. So it's top one's solar, bottom one's hydro. But the, the brilliant thing about this is you can go into the settings and one of these is configurable for a wind turbine. Now, ignore that side because it doesn't get up to that speed. So I, don't, I haven't set those settings. Um, but when you tick it for wind turbine, you're then able to tweak all of the voltages and the amps. The voltage is related to the speed of the turbine. And uh, as you change the voltages, the amps, you know, the relationship between volts, watts and amps, um, the amps will change. So you can go through here and say at 50 volts, which is a certain RPM of the turbine, at 150 volts, I'd like you to be, um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure how this operates, but what I discovered was that these were all set too low. And when we turn this on initially, we were putting out 350 watts on exactly the same flow rate and exactly the same pressure of the turbine. Whereas when I um, increased the amps, I think this was just limiting itself. So it only had like one or two amps that it was letting in because that was the, uh, the settings here were like 0 0.5, 0 0.75, one, 1 1.5, like really low. Um, so I've changed this side. We're not likely to get up to the speed here. So I've just left them as default. Um, probably shouldn't do that, you should probably work your way all, all the way through, but um, after changing these settings, we got from 350 to 550, and then I thought, well, let's just keep going and see where we end up. And we've ended up at 750 with really reliable um, numbers. And I know it's, it's probably not a good idea to start just playing around with settings, but what I've discovered is when you started increasing the amps, you got to a stage where the, the relationship would just change. So you'd never, if you have increased this up to nine, this wouldn't suddenly start over volting the volts would go down and the amps would go up so it was kind of like we got to 750 and then as soon as i started tweaking tweaking anymore it just kind of stopped as in it wouldn't go any further so and then i pulled it back a bit just to make sure that we weren't doing anything silly with the system so um but to have the ability to do that inside the inverter is it's just amazing so i'm going to do a whole video of the inverter uh, we've had a chap called mark who's been giving me a lot of help setting that up so um, because we've worked our way through a lot of the issues, such as the generator, um, the hydro, we've got solar. I'm going to do a, a separate video just on that because um, I'm just so impressed with it. I thought, I thought I'd share my thoughts on um, how, that, how that operates with, with the system we've got here. Because we're off grid, so we're not grid tied. So it's a bit different setting an inverter up if you're in that situation. So there we go, 750 watts, continuous with a trip every two days over the turbine just to clear it out, which, you know, is not all that bad. I'm, I'm around there most of the time anyway. And it keeps you on top, doesn't it? If you're checking these things regularly, you're not suddenly going to have a catastrophic failure because you're constantly checking the temperatures, you're checking, uh, temp you know, are the bearings overheating? You're, you're keeping your eye on it, which means that these big surprises um, shouldn't sneak up on you quite as often. So I don't mind going up there and checking it every now and again. Um, 750 watts, continuous, far more than we need right now. Version two, like I said, will be much more fun. Um, certainly dragging that pipe up there. So there we go, 750 watts. Come join us in the next one. Not sure what it'll be as we've had a new baby. I'm taking a little bit of time off construction. So if you'd like to come see whatever that is, come join us, it'll be nice over there. See you in the next one.